Welcome to CSIS Online. The way we bring you events is changing, but we'll still present live analysis and award-winning digital media from our Dracopolis Ideas Lab. All on your time, live or on demand. This is CSIS Online. Good evening, everyone. Good morning to those uh, joining us from Asia. Um, I'm Michael Green, Senior Vice President uh, for Asia at CSIS, Director of uh, Asian Studies at Georgetown University, and delighted to have uh, with us again um, the Governor of the Japan Bank for International Cooperation, uh, Tadashi Maeda. Um, Maeda-san is one of the most, I would argue, I think many would agree, one of the most important thinkers on economic strategy in the Indo-Pacific uh, in any country today, uh, influential in Japan, but also in um, uh, the United States and Europe, uh, sought after for his expertise on uh, infrastructure finance, but more broadly economic statecraft. And that's our topic for today, a, a dialogue with Governor Maida on Japan's economic statecraft in the year 2022. Um, uh, Maida-san uh, is well known, I'm sure, to many in the audience. He's a graduate of Todai, uh, Tokyo University of Law, Hogakubu, Faculty of Law uh, at Tokyo University. He has held uh, all the key positions at JBEC, including leadership on energy, uh, corporate planning, um, senior managing director and CEO. Um, and he's held key positions in government as well, special advisor to the cabinet uh, from December 10 to December 2012, which by the way, of course, was under a different government, under the DPJ government, but then retained as a senior um, advisor and sought after expert by the LDP coalition. Um, he has bipartisan connections in Japan and in the U.S. as well. Um, Maida-san is going to um, give his remarks uh, about um, Japan's economic statecraft at a really critical ju juncture in the United States. Um, we are anticipating a new uh, Indo-Pacific strategy from the Biden administration. There are promises that there will be an economic uh, framework, an Indo-Pacific economic framework. We are told there will soon be a new nominee to run the Development Finance Corporation in the U.S., the counterpart to Midasan. There's a lot of waiting uh, for some big economic statecraft from the U.S. W when the people are in place, when the um, initiatives are announced and elaborated uh, on by the administration, um, I have no doubt that they will expect to work most closely of all with Japan. And one of the most central figures they'll work with, of course, is Tadashi Maida. So Maida-san, economic statecraft in Japan in 2022. Um, I look forward to your comments, then we'll open it up. You can ask questions uh, through the CSIS website and I'll uh, convey those to Maida-san after his uh, opening remarks and some back and forth between us. Thank you very much for joining us virtually, if not in person. Thank you, Dr. Green. Uh, by the way, um, uh, Dr. Green and I have very good relations for me, uh, more than two decades. <clears throat> I'm Tadashi Maeda, Governor of Japan Bank for International Cooperation. It is my great honor and, and privilege to join this uh, uh, live event of the very prestigious think tank CSIS in Washington, D.C. I will uh, uh, give you a, a very quick view of what's going on in uh, Japanese government and also Japanese uh, uh, diet, national diet on the economic security. And then uh, I will uh, give you that that most updated information what uh, JPEG is doing right now, in particular, uh, under the context of the uh, uh, Free and Open Indo Pacific Initiative and, uh, and uh, cooperation among the three countries. U.S. and Japan and Australia, and then uh, a quad by adding uh, India as a part of our uh, partnership. So firstly, uh, that I will make a very quick review of uh, what's going on uh, in, in the Jap inside Japanese government. Uh, that discussion has al already happened, and discussion started from the Policy Research Commission of uh, Ruling LDP. And the key uh, figures uh, of this uh, uh, so-called task force on, this, on economic statecraft is Mr. Uh, uh, Akira Amari, uh, who is a very senior politician of LDP. And uh, uh, he uh, was a minister of state for 
the economic and fiscal policy. Uh, he ran the uh, uh, big, very uh, uh, important uh, the leadership on the on the uh, discussion on TPP, while he was an, uh, appointed as a minister, and then uh, he. Uh, uh, retired from government, and then that he joined at the uh, co-op leadership of uh, LDP. And uh, this uh, this uh, started last year. And because of the uh, 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 progress of the globalization of economic activities, and also the, uh, some conflict, especially in the Asian Pacific region, in the Pacific regions, with the rising uh, China. And also, uh, not only the China, the other uh, autocratic countries uh, have already uh, made some of uh, very uh, controversial action, including a cyber attack. And also that some of, uh, as COVID-19, uh, the outbreak of COVID-19, that the, we also more recognize that the vulnerability uh, of the supply chain of uh, uh, key uh, uh, sectors, including uh, semiconductors, and also uh, this will we recognize that this is uh, directly impact uh, on an auto supply chain. We uh, recognize the choke point, the bottleneck of this supply chain. Therefore, that the uh, we now recognize that uh, uh, our life uh, very much vulnerable right now because of this external event, and also uh, we recognize that. The uh, Japanese legal framework is not prepared yet, yet enough to uh, uh, to prevent any uh, negative uh, impact, especially uh, uh, preventing the outflow of the sensitive technology is a key issue. And Japan a, uh, is one of the three countries among the G20 uh, who do not have the legal framework of the uh, classified patent, so that uh, uh, very easily, uh, you know, uh, those uh, sensitive technologies patent to be uh, hacked and and, and sold out for to the uh, uh, countries uh, like uh, China or North Korea, or whatever. Therefore, that uh, we need to uh, make a, a key uh, uh, the effort to uh, to uh, fix this issue. And, and a, during Abe administration, by the way, Prime Minister Shinzo Abe, he uh, was a uh, prime minister for more than uh, seven years and nine, eight months. And uh, in April 2020, uh, he uh, created an economic section uh, at the National Security Secretariat, so-called NSS. And uh, uh, this, the, Office of Prime Minister is normally that's all combined with many uh, uh, staffers from on loan from many different uh, ministries, including METI, Ministry of Finance, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and Ministry of Defense, and so on and so forth. Uh, but the, the key uh, law uh, must be played by the National Security Secretariat. And uh, their uh, daily uh, met, uh, meeting, making a briefing to the Prime Minister and a key uh, 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 politicians at the Office of Prime Minister, including uh, uh, Chief Cabinet Secretary. Um, so that this is the first uh, step for Japanese government since the Abe administration. And then Mr. Sh uh, Yoshida Suga uh, succeeded uh, Mr. Abe as Prime Minister, and he was, uh, uh, was he struggled that the uh, avoid the uh, further negative impact of the COVID-19. He accelerated uh, vaccination. At the same time, uh, he is a uh, uh, he determined uh, to uh, uh, promote this economic statecraft, and also he uh, accepted to uh, make this uh, uh, bill uh, of the uh, economic security. And uh, Prime Minister uh, uh, Suga stepped down right after that Quad Summit in Washington, D.C., and, and uh, new leaders, new party leaders get directed to who is a, a Prime Minister, uh, no, uh, Mr. Kishida, Fumio Kishida. And then uh, he uh, dissolved all house very quickly, 
and then the uh, uh, call for the general election, and he won the election, and then the uh, Kishida administration uh, became more stable. And uh, in uh, October 2021, he appointed the uh, minister in charge of economic security, uh, uh, who is a very young politician, only a fourth time politician from MDP, Mr. Takayuki Kubashi. And uh, uh, at his policy speech of uh, Mr. Kishida, he uh, proclaimed very clearly that uh, these, the economic security bill to be delivered to the diet, the session of this diet. And uh, also that this number of the staffers of the economic division section of the uh, NSS be uh, uh, increased uh, from 20 to 50 uh, staffers right now. And the key point of this uh, bill is the uh, three points. Number one, in reinforcing the strategic autonomy, uh, in particular in critical infrastructure and uh, supply chain uh, of the key industries. And also two, uh, the acquiring the strategic indis indispensability of Japan in the uh, global uh, supply chain of the key industries. Three, uh, uh, maintaining and strengthening the international order based upon the fundamental values and rules. And uh, as I said earlier, that the uh, uh, most important piece of this uh, bill is that preventing the outflow of the critical uh, uh, the technologies by means of introduction of the new uh, piece of legislation of pre for preventing the outflow of the technology uh, by uh, introducing a uh, classified patent uh, legal framework. We do not have right now that the legal framework like a CFIUS. Uh, of the United States. So it is not exactly the same as CFUS is operating, but the, we know that the CFUS is working uh, in some sense uh, but, uh, from the viewpoint of the preventing the, uh, uh, the outfall of the critical technologies and, and so on. And also that the uh, elements like uh, uh, the critical mineral is also to be added onto this uh, legal framework. And uh, now the Kishida administration also uh, created uh, expert council uh, from the south, the uh, from south parties. And uh, the uh, this discussion is still going on, uh, but. Uh, 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 the summary internal information on this uh, export council, they articulated the importance of the discipline of the free trade and the transparency of the regulations and the sharing of a common uh, value uh, and uh, international cooperation with like-minded countries. And also sector must of under this uh, new regulation to be uh, focused query and in a transparent manner. And also that the, uh, they uh, also suggested to Japanese government to make the uh, necessary support uh, on both the uh, financial and legal. So uh, this is the event and now the legal uh, process of the, of the government is now still going on and the uh, uh, shortly, this draft bill will be uh, delivered uh, to the national diet in this session. And then uh, I would like to turn on, uh, uh, turn around to that most recent uh, activities of JVIC, especially on the, on, a, on the framework of free and open Indo-Pacific. This free and open Indo-Pacific, uh, this uh, concept is, was introduced by uh, Prime Minister Shinzo Abe and he delivered his speech and this new concept in 2007 in the uh, parliament of India. So it's the first time that the uh, Japanese readers 
uh, announced it's a very global initiative and uh, changing the mindset of the uh, very narrowly defined at uh, Asia Pacific, that beyond the uh, Malacca Strait, which is the choke point of, uh, uh, of the supply chain of the uh, of sea vein, to Indian Ocean and the, and the West. And uh, the Chinese leadership already announced that the uh, One Belt, One Road initiative. And in some sense, uh, free and open the Pacific is a counter proposal to uh, to uh, uh, one belt one road initiative. And uh, uh, under this concept, uh, we formulated uh, the very uh, clear and very effective partnership among the like-minded countries, starting from the U.S., Japan, and Australia. And then uh, during the Trump administration, uh, the US TFC, as Dr. Green referred to, was created uh, as a result of the merger between the OPIC and the part of USAID, and also that the role and uh, the function of, uh, of US TFC uh, was the expanded. Uh, and also, uh, originally, that OPIC was a uh, insurance agency, so that by nature, the insurance agency is uh, very active. Mm -hmm. However, that now USDFC uh, becomes more more proactive, uh, the a agency right now. And in Australia, Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, DFAT, and Export Finance Australia, uh, DF Australia very uh, uh, feel that they are very vulnerable from the uh, aggression uh, from China. And also not just only their own country, but also that the countries in the uh, uh, island nation, like uh, Papua New Guinea or, or Fiji or Tonga, most recently, uh, in South Pacific. And also uh, these, some of these countries have some diplomatic ties with Taiwan. And uh, uh, so that's a very, complicated, but also that uh, because of the COVID, those island countries uh, became more vulnerable, and not just only COVID, but also the climate change. Uh, therefore, that uh, they are really keen on the uh, support from the uh, countries like US and Japan and Australia. Uh, so that we made a, a, a platform of the sharing information among the three, uh, countries and regularly we have the online meetings and also uh, before COVID we uh, uh, dispatched the joint mission to countries uh, in a, in a, uh, ASEAN like Indonesia and Vietnam so that uh, and also <clears throat> when I had a, a meeting with a Vietnamese Prime Minister uh, Gwen Xuan Phuc then now he's a president and also from in China pre, a, a Prime Minister I strongly advocated for that concept of this uh, uh, quad and trilateral and quad partnership and to uh, countries like in Vietnam. And the first project under this uh, the partnership uh, successfully launched, which is a uh, uh, submarine cable connection uh, from the Palau to the main cable from uh, Singapore to West Coast of the United States. That's a uh, already a signed a long agreement from JVIC and also USDFC and the DFAT in the December of 2021. And uh, on the quad, but also that the two uh, leaders summit, one the virtual, on, in March and then the physical in September. JVIC participated to the Quad Vaccine Expert Group. And uh, uh, Japanese uh, uh, firms, especially uh, pharmaceutical industry, are not so prepared to produce vaccine uh, yet. Therefore, uh, if we uh, uh, too much focus on activities of Japanese companies, uh, our support must be uh, very limited. Therefore, that I remove this uh, statutory constraint 
and to be a may, very flexible interpretation of our, our statute. And then in, his, in a uh, Quad Summit meeting in September, the, uh, our contribution or support the uh, expansion of uh, uh, manufacturing capabilities of India of uh, vaccine and its supply to the, to the vulnerable countries, uh, roughly and one hundred million dollars pronounced to be expected. These uh, uh, figures are uh, officially cited in the uh, fact sheet of the Quad Summit. And also on critical mineral, uh, JBIC has been supporting uh, the uh, uh, critical minerals, the uh, uh, supply. Uh, and we have experienced that China, almost 10 years ago, it put a ban on air assignment because of the some conflict of Senkaku Islands. So this is a, a kind of economic action and uh, under the concept of the economic statecraft of, of China. The, the autocratic countries like China and Russia have, have done a lot of these economic measures as a counter to uh, uh, the issues of political issues or geopolitical issues. So uh, this is the kind of wake up call for Japan that we need the, the economic action for pursuing that the uh, geopolitical uh, national interest. Therefore, that we have been uh, outreach the countries like uh, Vietnam and other countries, including Indonesia, now uh, to to keep some layer of sediment uh, for, and also that we uh, develop some technology to um, to uh, to get some more alternative uh, the. Uh, uh, critical minerals of Eleras. Um, and also the, the JB conducted uh, uh, some of this search of the of a view of Japanese companies, uh, more than uh, 600 uh, big com companies who were uh, uh, doing the overseas direct investment in globally every year. Most excuse me. Most recently, the uh, we announced this, this uh, mo uh, result of this uh, research. For example, that uh, the uh, semiconductor, <clears throat> sixty-five percent of the Japanese uh, companies uh, now recognize that negative impact of the shortage of of, uh, of uh, the semiconductor. Therefore, that we need a, a very resilient supply chain, and then, uh, for the, this, this because of this reason, six percent of of the corporation uh, is now already made an effort to uh, diversifying the source of uh, procurement of of these uh, uh, these critical uh, materials like uh, semiconductors, and uh, uh, seeking for the uh, other. Uh, uh, supply chain. Uh, so this is a, a not thing, a completed effort, but they <clears throat> they have been uh, doing. And also, uh, they are very very worried and concerned about the decoupling between the U.S. and China. And China is our neighbor. Therefore, that we are not able to escape from Chinese uh, threat. And uh, uh, so, Japan's uh, business is very keen. On the most more uh, 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 stable relations uh, between uh, uh, U.S. and China. However, uh, we have to stand up with our like-minded countries of uh, to, to cope against the uh, uh, um, the illegal uh, action by China or other other autocratic countries. And also, um, the, I also, uh, I understand that some of the narrow scope of the supply chain of Japanese companies, for example, um, the, in the European Union countries, 
So we uh, we are, our surveys uh, more most highlighted surveys of this uh, which country is the more promising over the mid term or long term. And for long term, like uh, ten years, that uh, the uh, first each of these promising countries among Japanese companies uh, is India. But medium term, such as five years, the promising countries uh, number top uh, number one ranking is still China. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, only the Germany is now in a seat at the 11th seat among 20s of the most prominent countries. And none of other European uh, unions, uh, European countries are not listed as promising countries from the viewpoint of Japanese uh, companies. Therefore, that's uh, not just only support for, uh, to support Japanese companies. We need to be a more proactive uh, outreach. Therefore, that JBX already created uh, uh, a private equity fund to support startup in uh, Nordic and Baltic countries. The size of this fund is 100 million euro, but it's not big. But uh, still, that the biggest fund in the in the region, and this uh, fund is focused on its support for startup. Of, uh, and together with uh, 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 three limited uh, partners from Japanese industries at uh, JBX, it's, in the, it's a subsidiary JBX IG partners uh, now play a role of the uh, general partners. And we already have the uh, more than uh, 1,000 the uh, uh, deal force. And then we, uh, they uh, picked up a very prominent, a uh, key uh, promising uh, the companies for the investment, and it's very successful. So that we've done the investment, we expect highly. And also, we are now preparing for that uh, very similar uh, kind of in platform of, of the investment to uh, uh, Central and the Eastern European countries. And, and we I expect that this new uh, platform to be launched within a uh, six to nine months. And we uh, know that Ch Chinese uh, uh, companies like Xi ATL, which is a uh, battery company, is already invested to Poland. And the Korean uh, companies like SK, LG, they are also that manufacturing uh, battery for uh, electric vehicles in Hungary. And therefore, that's the, uh, we need we need to encourage Japanese company to open up their eyes to that those uh, uh, countries may be some remote compared with the uh, Asia uh, nations. However, that we need to have more broader uh, approach and uh, JEP is, uh, is pleased to be a spearhead uh, of these uh, actions and uh, followed by Japanese companies, I expect. So uh, we have a very good relationship with the US DFC and other uh, agencies of the United States. And I, I, uh, despite this COVID situation, I was not able to uh, travel abroad. However, that we, I received many uh, key uh, officials uh, from uh, United States, including uh, Dr. Carl Campbell, who is a long-term friend of mine. I physically met him in, in July 2021 in Tokyo uh, when he accompanied uh, Dr. Joe Biden to the Tokyo Olympic game. And also I received the, uh, Ms. Anne Neuberger, who is the Deputy National Security Advisor of Key Technologies, <clears throat> Sensitive Technologies. And also most recently, I had a very good discussion with a uh, Under Secretary of State for Economic and uh, Energy Environment Affairs, uh, Mr. Jose Fernandez in, in my office. Um, also, JVIC is uh, uh, you know, promoting the carbon neutrality in Japan, and we have been approached that new uh, technologies and uh, 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 key industries, including uh, hydrogen, so that uh, uh, we already participated to that in some of uh, 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 partnership with other countries. And we made investment to uh, 
this is a uh, equity investment to the state of California for uh, hydrogen stations. Uh, so this is a effort, one of the examples that effort we uh, uh, JVX made, and uh, our uh, playing field has been expanded from uh, very traditional countries like ASEAN uh, to the more global activities. So that's a very quick review of uh, uh, my uh, uh, activities right now. Thank you, Dr. Green. Uh, thanks very much, Maida san And um, the portfolio you cover at JBIC is so comprehensive and so strategic that um, unsurprisingly, we have a variety of really interesting and difficult questions for you from the audience. <clears throat> but let me start first um, with some of my questions, um, continuing our dialogue uh, over these many years. Um, first of all, can you tell us a bit more about the trends you see in um, reshoring or uh, redirecting supply chains? You, you, you noted on the one hand that um, China's a big neighbor, that the JBIC survey shows continued interest in investing in China by companies. But on the other hand, you said very clearly China is an autocracy um, and is stealing technology. So how would you describe the trend? Is it decoupling? Is it some Japanese ex executives call it tapering uh, their investment, especially high technology? Um, and what role is JBIC playing to um, to facilitate any reshoring. I know that you had a fund set up to deal with COVID. Um, the Japanese government set up funds for reshoring from China. Um, what are the directions you see? How would you describe supply chain shifts in the last year or two for Japanese companies? And what's JBIC's role to support or accelerate some of those shifts? Well, uh, because so that one of the results of our surveys of the overseas direct investment of Japanese companies, the, they already, those uh, answers came from the companies uh, with, uh, which already have uh, business in China. Therefore, that they have to keep their business. However, they have uh, now becoming more nervous and more uh, paying more attention to the vulnerability and also that the, uh, they have to understand the vulnerability of the app for the technology, key technologies, and hacking uh, to, uh, to, uh, to uh, using some of the devices of, of the Chinese companies, the uh, uh, element has been embedded, like Huawei, for example, that's the, uh, therefore that's there now, uh, try to make more, more Preventional and and defensive to uh, to Jap uh, to Chinese, and also that they are now clearly differentiate of the market, the business in the West and the business in China. So this is not decoupled. However, that they have to this is made very uh, uh, defensive approach to the Japanese company, and also that the uh, companies. Uh, for entry of the you know, new entry from Japanese companies to Chinese ma market is becomes very uh, difficult right now. Therefore, that uh, they are more reluctant to uh, to do a, a new business, especially in a critical sector like uh, telecommunication and uh, uh, quantum uh, computing uh, or AI or robotic. So, uh, and also they're shifting the uh, manufacturing center from China to other countries. The uh, uh, Japanese government, especially METI also, that's announced it's a new program to support this shift of uh, manufacturing center from China to other countries. And the uh, mo most uh, uh, ben biggest benef uh, beneficiary of this program is uh, Vietnam. So uh, this is uh, one point. And uh, uh, two point is that now in our survey that the United States score is, is a remarkably up. Therefore, that uh, uh, the Japanese companies now uh, understand the clearly that the big market, 
besides China, big market in North America. And they also, uh, this, uh, uh, the U.S. becomes more uh, prominent uh, countries for direct investment from, from uh, uh, Japanese companies' point of view. Therefore, that's, they are very active right now in the United States. And uh, uh, also that new good uh, circumstances in the United States to, to do a business. Uh, so that more rule-based economy and very transparent framework. Uh, but at the same time, uh, Japan has a long history of uh, some of the uh, uh, tension or economic conflict with the United States, even though that we are ally for more than uh, two decades. Therefore, that uh, uh, therefore that as I stated. In a uh, document of the LDP uh, task force, it created indispensability uh, or, or autonomy uh, of, of, of Japan uh, in a long su supply chain of critical uh, sector, in particular semiconductor and others. Therefore, that uh, uh, we are now very much a, a practice the approach to uh, semiconductor industry uh, in, in Taiwan, and uh, uh, they will now uh, responded very favorably to the uh, approach of Japan. So Japan's um, diet will debate and probably pass the new economic security bill you described. Um, the U.S. Uh, has two major pieces of legislation that um, look similar, the USICA and the CHIPS Act, but both the Japanese and the American legislation would create financial and other incentives to invest more, particularly in high-end semiconductor um, fabrication. Do you, do you sense that the, the two governments or the private sector are um, coordinating more uh, in anticipation of these two pieces of legislation, one in Japan and then in the U.S.? Um, that would have both governments um, take policies to direct more and more um, uh, resources to, um, to, to high-end technology, especially semiconductor fabrication, at home? Or do you think that the Japanese um, Economic Security Bill and the U.S. CHIPS Act are actually creating some obstacles or complications between U.S. and Japan? Um, how, do you, how do you, I know you're familiar with both legislative efforts. How do you see them? Well, I listen to that the uh, leaders from business industry in Japan, like uh, Mr. Morita of NEC, for example, and uh, uh, they clearly uh, experienced already that the uh, some of uh, regulations uh, when they for, for that to when they try to acquire the U.S. companies by the CFIUS process, mm. and uh, he, he said that you know, it takes months. Uh, and that they demands to clear up this uh, those uh, regulation, and then uh, this is very. Uh, uh, he said that this is a, a some of disadvantage for non-U.S. companies to acquire U.S. companies. Therefore, that uh, uh, there's no loophole, by the way. But how, then also they don't have any intention to to do uh, loophole. However, more. Um, the uh, support, if they they have more uh, support from Japanese government to all the, to organize and coordinate with the U.S. counterpart, it's it's it must be better. However, that uh, it not does not happen, and also that this coordination not it, it, um, made yet, and uh, the long term the kind of a negative experience for the. the uh, uh, senior officials of, of government in Japan to, to have a very controversial dialogue with the U.S. counterpart, especially a UST, USTR. Yeah. Therefore, uh, in some sense, they were skeptical. That's, uh, that's my, my sense. But at the same time, that now they can do our use of technologies and they are using a Western arrangement, for example, that is. And if WTOs uh, more uh, completely work, it, they, they will, uh, the Japan will uh, 
use the WTO framework. However, that unfortunately is not done well. Therefore, that we need some of bilateral uh, coordination. Uh, most important allies uh, is the United States. You know, you mentioned the export control uh, issue, and in many ways, um, U.S. and Japanese companies are being subjected to export control rules by the by METI and by the Commerce Department and Defense Department that are not completely transparent or consistent. And remind me of the old, you know, Gyose Shido administrative guidance from the 1970s and 80s when METI officials would call up and say, don't do this, do that, and companies would have to comply. There's, there's an ad hoc uh, character to U.S. and Japanese export controls. And also, as you pointed out, are thinking about strategic support for semiconductor industries is is also not well coordinated. So there's a big coordination role for somebody. Do you think that um, do you think that uh, Kobayashi Takayuki, as the new economic security minister, could be that person who who forms the bridge between the US Japan to coordinate on all these 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 complicated issues? It's clear to me. It's not clear yet because uh, his uh, key job right now is he's now focusing on the passing this uh, new bill of this peace restraint right now. And he does not have enough staffers to work for him right now. Therefore, that uh, uh, this is still unclear that he, after the, the, this bill to be enacted, and he is still re remain a pro uh, uh, in a position to take a lead, of this uh, bilateral coordination with with U.S. counterparts, could be, but uh, probably a legal point of view that he, he's not in charge. In my view, is a Meti Meti minister uh, must be in charge, Mr. Hagiuda. Yeah, yeah. Um, so you you gave us a really detailed and comprehensive picture of Japan's economic statecraft in 2022. The Biden administration is promising that there will be an economic, Indo-Pacific economic framework in 2022. What do you hope is in this Indo-Pacific economic framework? What are the elements that are really critical that will convince not just Japan, but Vietnam, uh, Australia, Korea, others, that the US is serious about economic statecraft? Uh, we may be weeks, maybe months away from learning more details or not. I think it's still being debated. So what would you like to see in the US Indo-Pacific economic framework um, to help, you know, a free and open well, Indo-Pacific. My uh, very uh, my sense is that this is uh, there to be easier for coordination among Japan, U.S. and Australia. The trilateral that they uh, the framework is working very well, mm. but uh, quite so. Uh, India is very more uh, difficult to work with, especially uh, there are some regulation of. Uh, uh, Central Bank of uh, India uh, for external borrowing. Therefore, that if we try to, to make loans in US dollars to, to Indian company, India's uh, legal framework of so-called uh, uh, ECB, so this is a, a central bank regulation, is not the uh, uh, converting from, from uh, US dollar to Indian local currency, rupee, uh, uh, not allowed. So this is a still, uh, you know, Indian economy is still very much inward looking. Therefore, the, from the, the securities point of view, that India's uh, participation is very key. However, that uh, we need to uh, ask the Indian leadership to, uh, to change the, the regulation the more uh, open to the uh, like-minded countries. That's one point. Two, uh, other Asian countries, uh, uh, some countries are not skept, uh, 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 very skeptical of, of this quad framework. So that uh, they, they for, for example, Indonesia, they uh, need to have the so-called centrality of ASEAN. So ASEAN plus three or, or Asia, ASEAN. So ASEAN, in the, in the, historically, this was a central of this uh, uh, framework of coordination among the countries, so that they feel that the US, Japan, China, South Korea, their uh, external partner. Therefore, that, uh, uh, you know, that, uh, in approaching to the Asian countries, we're very careful on using uh, terms of quad. 
So the U.S. Indo-Pacific Economic Framework has to figure out how to work with India, um, but has to really be credible in Southeast Asia. Um, and um, what 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 would you like to see in it? Uh, if I can ask you one more time for some gaiatsu <laughs> pressure or suggestions, suggestions, what should be in this? I mean, the Secretary of Commerce Raimundo and Under Secretary Estevez and others have talked about supply chains. They've talked about digital trade. They've talked about rare earth. A lot of the issues you talked about. But what kind of actions would you like to see? Is this? Are we talking about trade agreements? Are we talking about a consultative, consultative mechanism? Um, do you have a concrete vision in your head for what a U.S. economic Indo-Pacific uh, framework would look like in action. A lot of the words are nouns, but there are no verbs yet. What does it look like when we actually implement it? What, what do you think is necessary? So uh, I need uh, more coordination, I mean, more precise coordination of the mm -hmm. different legal framework. Mm -hmm. And also we need to engage the, those countries. For example, Vietnam. Vietnam has a uh, uh, trade surplus uh, to the United States. Therefore, they are very concerned about uh, uh, the vulnerability of uh, criticizing from the from U.S. on this uh, trade imbalance, which we experienced personally. Uh, therefore, that's all uh, issues is starting from bilateral coordination. And then we are more than happy to coordinate with the United States and Vietnam so we can be a play, a play, a, we can play some role of a bridging uh, between the Asian, ASEAN countries ASEAN member countries and the United States. And also that I also understand that because of the uh, aggression from China on the South China Sea in particular, and code of conduct is not created yet, therefore that they are very much uh, welcome the U.S. presence right now. Mm -hmm. uh, therefore that uh, the U.S. must understand, the U.S. government, I mean, understand that this is kind of uh, uh, sensitivity uh, and then, uh, and also using uh, Japan as a uh, kind of a, uh, bridging uh, and a uh, fix the gap. So it sounds like what you are looking for in 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 the near term is not a traditional trade agreement, but a, a but a but an ambitious set of engagements, harmonization of policies and regulations, and coordination. Um, a lot of hard work. Um, but less politically difficult in, inside the U.S. system. Uh, let me turn to questions from the audience. Um, a journalist from the South China Morning Post wants to ask you what to expect from Kishida Biden uh, summits. You know, in a few days uh, there, there will be a virtual summit. What what would uh, be a successful summit uh, meeting uh, in, in the coming days when the two leaders uh, meet um, on uh, virtually? Well, Prime Minister Kishida is really uh, keen on a physical meeting with the President Biden as soon as uh, possible. Uh, but now, uh, in a diet session, uh, that the uh, budget for fiscal 2022 must be completed. Uh, and uh, then, uh, also that they are now focusing on that the uh, fight against the COVID-19, especially new uh, Omicron variant and then a number of the uh, infections uh, are very quickly uh, upsurging, increasing. And now in Tokyo uh, yesterday, a new uh, patient of Omicron variant is uh, more than 7,000. So uh, one month ago is only, only 30 or 40. This is so much very dramatically changed. Therefore, that uh, he needs to fix this issue uh, as a first priority. And then also, the uh, Prime Minister Kishida uh, must win a upper house election in July. Therefore, uh, in my view, politically, that uh, except the uh, meeting with uh, President Biden, his uh, uh, foreign uh, policy uh, will be uh, uh, not so uh, uh, moving quickly. Mm. And then he's more focused on the internal domestic issue, mm -hmm. in my view. Interesting. So the summit itself is not so important in terms of um, deliverables, but except for it sounds like getting a promise for an in-person in -person meeting soon would be would be a big success. Um, we have a question from the audience about human rights. Um, 
now that the U.S. has policies and legislation um, to prevent supply chains, American purchases and supply chains from going through Xinjiang and using slave labor and, and so forth. Um, and Japan also has now with uh, Gen Nakatani, a uh, really for the first time, a human rights uh, uh, czar. Um, how is JBIC thinking about um, human rights in its um, policies and its financing um, vis-a-vis -vis China, but 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 elsewhere in, in in Asia and the world. Well, as you know, Japan does not have the legal framework like a Magnitsky uh, Act, and uh, my my view, this is not likely in near future that they will create a similar uh, legal system like Magnitsky Act. Therefore, that uh, but at the same time, <clears throat> uh, we need to pay due attention to this. Uh, uh, abuse of human rights issue, especially Xinjiang, the, the, the forced laborers and then uh, in Xinjiang. And the, in an essence of uh, product uh, of Xinjiang, in, uh, not uh, besides the textile, is that the key is that polysilicon, which is a, 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 a key uh, element of, uh, of uh, uh, solar, solar power. Therefore, that we are very much ner uh, nervous on this using this as uh, polysilicon. Uh, therefore, that we need to uh, make a some certain research on that what this product will come from, mm. and also that uh, uh, no, we need to uh, make sure that there's no using uh, uh, forced labor and abuse of human rights in the process. Uh, in the products, oh, sorry, in the products of first like polysilicon. And textile is very um, famous right now, but needs the polysilicon is, a, is a, uh, a new one and more more cri more critical, I think. Mm. Interesting. Um, somebody from the audience asked if you could give more details about JBIC's um, carbon neutral policy. Um, how sweeping is this? You, you're not, are you saying that all new infrastructure financing will be carbon neutral? You're not saying that, right? Where are you? What, how far does, what's the scope of the carbon neutral policy? Well, uh, we, uh, they actually working on carbon neutral. We already created uh, uh, the force uh, midterm uh, management plan and already uh, uh, announced uh, in, in 2020. And we prioritize the uh, uh, carbon neutrality. And, uh, and ESG policy. We already announced our, Jap uh, our own ESG policy, and uh, we uh, successfully launched a new uh, green bond, which is a uh, uh, $500 million, and the first time for Japanese uh, government uh, created the entities uh, launched this, a green bond. We successfully did it. And also, uh, we're more actually engaged with a carbon neutrality, especially uh, so by means of the supporting the uh, uh, key technology and uh, uh, key materials uh, like uh, uh, hydrogen and, uh, and ammonia and so, so forth. But we need to make these two, it's still very uh, uh, costly, therefore that we need to uh, these uh, alternative materials, uh, which is uh, indispensable for the carbon neutrality, because we don't have um, uh, fossil fossil fuel resources in Japan. Therefore, that this is very key, and we, also that this cost must be reduced and then to be affordable for the consumers. Therefore, uh, uh, we are paying due attention to four supply chains, and and they, and also that. Uh, in a cost element of hydrogen, for example, both uh, demand side and supply side. So, uh, and also we stop, we already announced to stop the financing to coal fire power plants. And uh, also key uh, missing piece is that the transitional source of source, in particular, uh, natural gas is not pipeline gas, but it's a leaky, leaky friend natural gas, LNG. 
but we need to uh, make clear that this is a transition, transitional one. Therefore, that we need to focus on the long-term goal. So that uh, that's a very key point that we uh, we already stated. Uh, that's a that's a sound strategy. Um, both ending financing for coal and looking at LNG as transitional. Um, if we had more time, I would ask you if that's how the Biden administration sees those issues. But I suspect that this will be an ongoing debate um, uh, within the administration here in Washington. Um, we had another question about defense uh, exports. You know, the, the Japanese government relaxed the so-called three uh, arms export uh, rules uh, to make it easier to provide um, articles to countries like the Philippines or Vietnam so they have more maritime patrol and more um, uh, ability to, to understand what's happening in their waters, maritime domain awareness and so forth. There was a lot of talk about JBIC playing a role in helping to finance some of this uh, engagement with countries like the Philippines and Vietnam to, to make it easier to, 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 to provide those articles. Can you update us on yeah, discussions uh, in that area? Right, from the viewpoint of the uh, uh, for official financial support from JB to these uh, defense materials, uh, is that the, we need to have a clear action by the uh, National Security Secretariat and also that uh, NSC uh, uh, chaired by Prime Minister. Uh, without this uh, direction, we are not able to make financial support, number one. Number two, we already had a, a case. It's uh, still ongoing, it's not finished yet. That is, uh, one, it is a uh, big uh, confidential, so that I cannot disclose everything, but this is a uh, deployment of the frigates to, to Indonesia. And uh, uh, Defense Minister Kishi and uh, Defense Minister of Indonesia, Prabowo Subianto, already signed a couple of memorandum of understanding. I participated to that, the uh, very initial negotiation, and I, I uh, uh, took a lead of the financial negotiation uh, with uh, uh, Defense Minister Prabowo uh, Subianto of Indonesia. And this is uh, not uh, fully completed yet, but now still under negotiation between the uh, defense, defense, uh, Ministry of Defense of the Indonesia and also the Ministry of Defense of Japan. Uh, but it's a, uh, our Ministry of uh, Defense, very uh, uh, frankly, uh, not have any uh, expertise, especially the financial issue. Therefore, that's uh, where daily basis our, our staff is a, is a uh, uh, our staff are supporting the negotiation and discussion with uh, Indonesia. I know also Indonesia uh, part that not just only defense, but also the it's, uh, key ministry like uh, Minister of Finance. Therefore, that I had some initial contact with uh, Suri Muriani, who's a defense, uh, finance minister uh, of Indonesia, and also coordinating Minister for Investment and Maritime Affairs, Luhut Panjaitan, on this issue. So it's, there's no legal obstacle. Um, it's, it's, it, 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 it sounds like you still require some guidance from the NSC and the Prime Minister's office um, to, to uh, complete this work. It's, it's great talking to you, as always, Maida San. It's so interesting because JBIC is at the center of uh, so much of um, Japan's engagement, whether it's infrastructure financing, as we just heard, uh, defense uh, articles and frigates are significant for countries like Indonesia, um, energy, supply chains, technology, and now with a key uh, role in ensuring that uh, Japan uh, is upholding its values by not purchasing um, forced labor products and so forth. So it's a, it's a huge and very strategic uh, account you have, and it's really fascinating. And um, the Lowy Institute, in its uh, report on power in Asia, uh, listed Japan as the leader of the liberal order in Asia, which was a, which was a bit of a criticism of Trump too. But but it's obvious that the um, the muscle and the brain for that uh, comes from JBIC. 
So um, we really appreciate your sharing your insights. Hope to do this in person next time. Um, and in the meantime, uh, thank you very, very much for joining us. I think everyone in the audience got a great deal out of your insights. Thank you, Dr. Bain, my audience. I, I also hope that we can get together physically uh, in the near future. Thank you. Thank you all very much for joining us.